Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Nerdrotic Podcast. I'm your host, John Reed, and we've got a bit of a special show today. Um, my favorite new author agreed to do uh, an, an interview, uh, new new to me, I guess. I started reading his stuff last year, uh, and as you guys may know, I got married last year. So his words were basically the backdrop for the year of my marriage. And so I'm very happy to have him on here. He's got a new book coming out in five days on Amazon, which is the last of the Super Powered series, year four. Uh, joining me, Drew Hayes. How's it going, Drew? It's going good. It's going good. I'm down in Texas and the weather is above 60 today. So oh, pretty fun that's day. Nice. Yeah. Do you miss, like, do you get like rainstorms and, and, uh, and snowstorms? Do you have weather actually where you are? Oh, we get rain. We get plenty of rain. <laughs> That's um, good. I'm up in Dallas, so we don't really get snow. I lived in Lubbock for college, and we would get like the occasional snow. More often, we would get um, rain, which would then turn to ice because the drainage system in Lubbock is god awful. And then you would just have people slipping around the roads. <laughs> So I don't yeah. miss the cold. <laughs> I, I kind of, so I grew up in San Francisco. We didn't have like snow or whatever, but we had like weather. And then I moved to LA and like, I crave like a snowstorm. Like I sit at home <laughs> just like waiting for like, I, I watch movies and when it's like, uh, you know, like blustery out in, in movies and TV, I just kind of get very like, oh, I wish that were me today. Uh, I don't know, but I guess I have to just move. I guess I just have to do that. Um, so you so let's talk about superpowers a little bit. Um the the fourth book is coming out in a few days and essentially the world of superpowers is is like kind of like an X-Men world, right? Where people have powers, some are able to control them and some aren't. And so I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about like your influences like growing up like were you a comic book fan were you into like genre tv what what were some of the things that like influenced you to start writing this sort of stuff oh good god i mean i'm such a child of media in so <laughs> many aspects i read all through childhood i loved tv and movies um comic books of course as well just just a standard nerd in basically every capacity with like theater sprinkled in too so that's why i'm comfortable on camera oh, or nice. microphone in this <laughs> yeah. case I, I gotta get it into a, like a web camera at some point yeah it's probably uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things that you never think about until you actually until need you it. actually need it yeah i yeah. i've had to, to like mail out web cameras to people that i've been doing shows with recently so like i always just take it for <laughs> granted that it's there and then like somebody would be like oh by the way i can't do video and i'm like oh right that's a thing um yeah i'm in my 30s like video is not a thing that happens in my life <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess to dive into like your exact question, I mean, obviously superheroes were a big one. Um, I grew up on a lot of the good, you know, as much as comic books were not great in the nineties, which was a lot of our childhoods, um, <laughs> the animated stuff was freaking killing it. Like I remember growing up on those and even all the edgy dumb stuff that was happening in comics. Like you, it gave you enough of a taste of the real character that you could kind of go back and find some of their stuff. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm all over. I love supernatural stuff. Um, I love, obviously, superheroes. I love tales of myth and fantasy. And I don't know. I, I, I guess superheroes have always sort of been my favorite because it's a, a great modern um, parallel to the old god tales. And it's also an interesting way to dissect what happens when you thrust power into the hands of people just regular people and seeing how that getting to play with the idea of how that would impact things. Yeah. I was, I've always kind of wondered reading, reading your stuff. Like it has like that X-Men tinge of like, like teenagers who have to deal with this thing. And I know super, super powers specifically takes place like in college. Right. Um, and then what's interesting, Drew, is that I actually got introduced to your stuff through villains code, which I would say is the more like mature, you know, it, they're, they've graduated, right? Like at that point. Um, and it's not in the same world, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like a school, it, it's, it's this like group of villains. 
is doing like a, you know it's much i think it's more mature than than superpowers in like in like the age that everyone is um so it's funny because superpowers became like my love like i i read villains i read a uh, forging of festus and then i went back and kind of explored your other stuff and I just got that like nostalgia toward like, you know, like the best stuff of the X-Men or the best stuff of <laughs> Teen Titans. And it's like in a novel. Uh, so did, were you a fan of like the X-Men cartoon? Oh, well, I mean, who wasn't? I yeah. mean, of our age bracket, that was, I think, the gold standard to which action cartoons were held for a little while. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, you had Justice League and Justice League Unlimited uh, yep. later on. And God, those were freaking amazing i mean we grew up with the timiverse the batman animated series the superman animated series like all that really good iconic shit that has held up so well yep if you had to go into like a actually let's go with this what was the first comic you ever read do you remember no i i don't remember <laughs> the first of anything i ever read or watched <laughs> I, it, it's it's drowned under a sea <laughs> Yeah, I got you. Uh, well, if you went into a comic book shop tomorrow, what would be the first like aisle you'd go to? Like, would you be? Would you have a specific like? Okay, this is the stuff I'm going to go to first and see what I'm missing of. I would probably swing through and check out some of the newer stuff because I've heard great things. Um, I recently picked up uh, the first two volumes of the new Miss Marvel, and I was given that a run through um, just because I've been hearing it was really, really good, and it was pretty dang good. Uh, yeah. I haven't kept going because it's just, you know, I don't I don't still really follow the comics because it's just a very expensive hobby. Oh, God, it and, is. Uh, <laughs> I've, I get enough superheroes. I'm OK. Yeah, right now. <laughs> you're consumed with superheroes. Um, so when the new so kind of switching gears a little bit, when the new uh, Star Wars came out, uh, The Last Jedi, I immediately was like Alex Griffin. He's the last Jedi. Damn it. Uh, so. <laughs> What was it like? Uh, first of all, what did you think of of the new? How, what do you think of the new Star Wars movie? Considering you have such a love for it in this character in Superpowers, who actually like has manifested the powers of a Jedi. Um, so, uh, to be perfectly honest, that was sort of more of a tribute to a good friend of mine than it was like a passion. Like I've seen all the Star Wars, and I've generally enjoyed all the Star Wars, but it's not something I have like the same kind of passion for that I know a lot of people do. And I definitely don't want to uh, falsely own a fandom. I. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> But you um, did, you treated so well. Like the stuff that Alex does is like even cooler and more like authentically Jedi than some of the stuff we've seen in recent Star Wars movies. Like, uh, so, you know, it just seems as if like you, you've got it, man. Like you understand what it should be. Well, if you're um, going to play with someone else's property, you have to treat it respectfully. And that, and that's <laughs> what I try to always go by. Also, I really don't want them to sue me and I'm not sure how far. <laughs> parody law will protect in this case so you know <laughs> he didn't um, bust out a lightsaber at any point so i think you're no okay. no he did not that was one of the funniest <laughs> things is people uh, in the comments because it was a web serial would frequently be like why won't he why won't the tech guy build a lightsaber for alex and i i just sat there and was like you understand they're competing with each other right like, <laughs> right <laughs> that and you know license um why doesn't batman build the joker uh, a mech suit <laughs> Not really in his best interest now, is it? <laughs> Not exactly. But Will was like very, uh, I mean, he built uh, Camille a, a suit, essentially, right? So she could use her powers. And he was he like pretty nice. Fabric, like, and she asked him for it. That was also the difference. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Alex never went to him for anything. Um <laughs> Yeah, and so did you have it when when you were um, writing the the arc that revolved around all the kids going to a, a movie premiere? Like, uh, what was the name of the movie again? Oh, uh, Star Puncher. Yeah, Star Puncher. Was that uh, what did you like? What did you draw from in in writing that arc? Oh, the most just I love glorious, terrible '80s sci-fi and action movies, and I was just trying to think of like what's the most quintessential vibe that sort of can capture that and star puncher really felt yeah. like it well forgive the putt it hit the note or hit the note well <laughs> it's uh it's like what it's sharknado meets uh star wars or something like that That's something great. like that <laughs> oh man so 
I wanted to talk to you a little bit about like how you come up with, you know, we've talked about Alex where he's manifested the powers of a Jedi. And so like in this school for superheroes, he, you know, he, everyone thinks he's telekinetic and he's like, no, like I'm, I'm a Jedi. Like, this is what I am. How do you come up with unique and interesting power sets from um, being able to control your body completely like Chad to the God field of globe? Like how, how did you come up with the, these interests because that was what really really stood out to me was that you were giving me power sets and characters that i truly hadn't really seen before um how what was your process for figuring that stuff out um i mean obviously some of them were of course derivative of the classics you know super strength super speed um thomas didn't have a ring but his power his energy sure. was very green, yeah. green lantern-esque spiritual um, weapon yeah, and then some of them were just sort of thinking about, I don't know, natural things that we can do, or um, I, I genuinely don't know. I just sort of sat there and brainstormed what would be really cool, and <laughs> then sort of reverse engineered powers out of it. Like, oh, okay, but could this be used and could it grow? I mean, you mentioned the maturity uh, difference between superpowers and villains code, uh, and that and that's very true and very intentional because they're kind of frames for different stories. And one of the contexts of superpowers is it has to sort of fit the frame of growing. Um, so if a power on the surface was like, okay, that seems kind of stupid. But then when I was like, if we really put a lot of thought and effort into it, could it be cool? So if it had the potential to grow, that was when I was like, all right, that one is going to be good because obviously growth is a whole function and part and theme of it. Yeah. I, and I was actually going to get to that with villains code those are some of my favorite powers, right? Like um, the, I, I'm forgetting names right now, but the, the kid who can like pull objects out of video games uh, was- Ah, Cyber Geek. <laughs> Cyber Geek was one of the, the like the just a light bulb went off where I was like, that's brilliant. Like the idea that he's, and like they figure out a way to connect him to the, like so that he can use like a little wristband to pull like objects out and he's got to level them up in the game. Like there's all this cool stuff in there that's just completely different and like, it's like why like i just have no idea how like you were able to just like come up with that like i don't know it's just so crazy to me like th that stuff is so cool and like after seeing so many tv shows and reading so many comics where it's just like layers of the same thing over and over again i can't tell you how you know it's kind of inspiring it is to see something new like and and of the time right um with cyber geek like where did are you a gamer like where did that come from oh yeah i mean tabletop i mean i'm not great at video games but i i still enjoy them and um i mean i think we've all just had that thought of god if only i had the portal gun right now or <laughs> yeah. Yeah. god or what i wouldn't give for like a mech armor to leap out of this or that sort of thing and it's it was just sort of a uh, having that thought and thinking oh but what if i could yep. what would be the parameters what would be the limiters I, I guess the realest answer is I just get way too obsessive about nitpicking my own daydreams. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's fair. Cause yeah. Cause in, in villains code, there's also um, the girl who she can say common sayings and bring them to life. And like, that was another one where uh, you know, it's, it's steeped in mythology. It's steeped in like the idea of like um, words and ideas, giving power to, uh to to objects or people right and it's a theme you see in 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 yeah like in mythology or like fables or whatever but you i don't know you rarely see in like modern you know superhero or or, or you know whatever the modern version of all that stuff is um so she was she was another one that really stuck out to me is like yeah maybe i would see this in fables but in this context when you've got like johnny three dicks over there <laughs> uh this is so interesting to see her play in that same playground. Is is that conscious for you to like have those foils in, in, in all these stories? I mean, by foils, do you mean like the Johnny three dicks comic relief or just, just the. With, with John, you know, the, um, the kind of like, you know, gritty gratuitous comic book thing with, with Johnny three dicks versus like this sweet girl who has, you know, she can make the like, popular sayings come to life. You know, it's, they don't seem like they would be in, in a similar playground, but they fit so well when, you know, it through your narrative. 
Well, that's part of the reason I did um, Villain's Code as its own series. And by the way, thank you for uh, appreciating Chloe slash cliche. I think she is my favorite power I've ever come yes. up with just for pure randomness. But um, so part of the reason I did Villain's Code as its own series and not like set in the superpowers world was that I really wanted to tell different kinds of stories. And I love uh, doing SP, but SP by its nature is rooted in the idea of realism. Like it tries to... Uh, put a realistic scope as much as is possible when dealing with superpowers on on the ideology of superheroes. Um, and that's good for like real small personal stories and that sort of thing. But if you want to do the bombastic stuff of the Silver Age, which is sort of what I was going for, was just that big clusterfuck time when like anything went, anything was possible. And, uh, you know, to do that, you sort of have to play by different rules. And, and that's sort of the difference too, is that we can have a world where, yeah, there's like unconquerable beings of imagine of immense power. And then there's cliche. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, uh, with superpowers too, the, the world that you created, not only the dynamic between the powers and the supers, but this world where essentially like Stark wins civil war or the mutant registration act actually was a thing from the very beginning. Like in reading this, you've convinced me that that's like how it should have been from the be like the beginning, right? Like soup, the, the whole idea of the um, secret identity, right? Like um, is strengthened through this idea that they have to um, that they have to register that that like the that there's this organization who knows who they are and so aside from that organization they have to be completely secret i loved how that like strengthened those themes was that something was that actually drawn off that or or is that was just, that just something to um create like a niche for the hcp to exist in the world it was sort of a side effect of trying to tether the uh, series with a core of realism, because the simple truth of the matter is I'm not such an optimist that I think if superpowers suddenly started popping up, there would really be any discussion. I feel like it would just kind of happen really fast um, because, you know, you don't have to go back historically to see that when people who don't have power suddenly get it, shit goes real sideways real quick. And uh, I think it would basically... My guess is right now, if people suddenly had superpowers, either it would end in like a registration, like we have to have accountability, or the country would implode. Um, <laughs> and that's yeah. really any country. Like it's just if you threat, if suddenly people have power, that's chaos. So it's either going to be chaos or someone's going to forge order. And in this incarnation, I decided to assume order was forged. Um, oh, so uh, sorry I, for for everybody. This is actually live. I saw in the chat some some questions about this. Um, if you want to ask any questions from Drew, you can go ahead and use the super chat button at the bottom. It's a little dollar sign. We'll answer any questions. Stay away from spoilers, or you know, we're not going to address anything like. Uh, yeah, I would not say I'll answer any question. <laughs> right, right. Well, we'll we'll do our best. Um, so you can go ahead and use that super chat. Also, if you want to support uh, Drew, he's uh, he's got a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash, do you know what the link is? We can put I it believe it's probably Drew Hayes Novels. Yeah, so patreon.com slash Drew Hayes Novels. Go over there. You can support all the stuff he's doing with with all of his books, with his Authors and Dragons uh, podcast. I would actually steer them toward the Authors and Dragons ones, to be honest. That's probably got the better set of rewards. Because that's a it's a patreon.com slash authors and dragons. That's run by the whole Authors and Dragons podcast. And there's actual podcasts tucked away behind there. Which is more and, than just me. And we will talk about a lot of that stuff later because uh, you know, we're we just launched our own D D show over on Twitch. And so I, yeah, I can't wait to, to talk about that stuff with you. Um and if you want to support us over on Patreon, patreon.com slash nerdrotic podcast. Um, or I think it's just patreon.com slash nerdrotic. I don't know, one of those. Uh, so go check it out. It'll all be in the show notes. Um, so uh, let's talk about role-playing games a little bit. Um, how did Authors and Dragons come about, and what is it? Uh, so it came about, maybe I should start with what it is. What yeah, it that's is, probably a good idea. Is, uh, it's a podcast in which several comedy fantasy authors all play uh, you know, a and d style game. We're actually using a Pathfinder system but we crib from D, D left and right so it's sort of in them it's it's close enough and let's be honest pathfinder is D D three yes um so it's a game where they play D D horribly um they are just the worst 
the second episode, a character tried to drown himself. Nice. Realized he wasn't drowning fast enough, got out, grabbed a rock, jumped back in. <laughs> and it's genuinely only gotten dumber since uh, <laughs> the best way. Uh, it's myself, Robert Bevan, Rick Gulteri, John Hartness, uh, Joseph Brassy, and Steve Wetherill. And uh, I am the GM. They are the rapscallions that test my planning and patience at every turn. Um, and it's fun. <laughs> and it's funny. And it came about because I was actually doing uh, a release for Fred, the vampire accountant one. And um, I'm not sure if you know about my release day tradition. But... No. What is, what's your release day tradition? So I do I do a Facebook party. I, do, I take questions. <laughs> um I do like trivia and prizes and stuff, and that's fun. But I also, every time there's a five-star review on a book on release day, you know, from my advanced readers, or in the case of shorter books, people who read really fast, um, I do a shot and I post a picture of it. And that's, you know, always fun. But it means by the end of release days, I'm usually buzzing pretty well. And uh, so I was just on Facebook uh, shooting the shit with Robert Bevan. And he, we were talking about games and I was talking about a superhero game I'd been in that was hilariously bad. <laughs> and uh, we just sort of, the, the idea just kind of came together and we started rolling with it. And we uh, got other people involved and it, it's, it's kind of snowballed into what it is today. That's bad. So do you, uh, do you watch any other, like any other streams or anything? Are you a critical role fan or, uh, any of the other like D and D podcasts are, are, do you consume that stuff as well as create in that world? Uh, like every now and then if someone recommends it, like, Hey, this is like a good way to stylize this or to be clear on this point. Um, I can check that. I'll check it out. But to be perfectly honest, if I'm going to deal with D and D, I'd rather be playing it. Yep. Um, I don't get a lot of joy from watching other people play it. So it's, <laughs> It's not high on my entertainment list. Do you? Uh, how did you get into D and D in the first place? Was it like friends of friends when you were a kid, or is it a more recent? Obviously, you're a DM, so you must have uh, got into it much earlier. Um, I I feel like we sort of covered this earlier with the whole I was a giant nerd, <laughs> <laughs> um, and my friends were nerds, and they brought me into it. I've been playing since I was 15 years old. So, oh, that's uh, awesome. Just, I mean, on and off through high school, played a lot in college, dropped off for a little bit uh, after graduation because distance and then internet systems World like 20. World 20 became available. And I was yeah. like, shit, yeah, let's do this. It's so crazy, man. Like I, uh, cause I'm a huge nerd too. <laughs> and I, for some reason, like I'd always wanted to play and there was never like a group when I was a kid and I just kind of like lost track of that interest. And then in the last like year and a half, I've just been like, Oh yeah, I remember how much I wanted to do this. And I've just like delved, you know, like dived in. I love the internet for that too. Like if you're like, Oh, I want to do this thing. You could just go find a group and like start like a hundred percent, just diving into stuff full force. Uh, so like, I I'm, I'm jealous of people who have been able to say like, Oh, I've been playing for fifth. Cause it's just like, Oh, I feel like I've missed out on so many years of D and D. Oh, bad. Um, the wild party years of D and D in your exactly. Youth. <laughs> I know well, I was, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> stay away from that. Um, so what are some of your other favorite, do you have, have, uh, you said you played a superhero game. Is are these all like uh like D twenty uh, skins, or are you doing like actual other role playing games uh, with this? Oh, I mean, I, I've been around for so long on so many gaming groups. I've been, I think, around most of the major ones. I've done, um, oh god, uh, the old White Wolf system um, back like two, I think maybe two reboots ago. It's been a long time. Um, obviously D and D Pathfinder, uh, Savage Worlds, uh, did a GURPS game like once or twice, nice. um, Star Wars D and D for a while, really as, as much as I joked earlier, I think maybe that's why I know a fair bit about the Star Wars mythos is because one of our friends in college loved it so much and he loved the role playing game and he would run games and it's like, well, I mean, it's fun to play when your buddy is like super passionate and puts a lot of work in. So, yep. Um, I, I played a lot of that. Like it, I've never picked it up again since, but he was <laughs> such a good DM. I was like, yeah, this is great. I'll play this forever. Um, uh, good DM is the best. Oh, yeah. uh, Mutants and masterminds was the game that uh, precursed authors and dragons in my, in my play history where 
you play superheroes and we were so bad at it we became uh domestic terrorists within the first two games (laughs) nice nice i i okay so that actually leads into the next thing i want to talk to you about um we are going to be launching a show over at tpk games on twitch which is going to be an rpg book club where we're going to take a book we're going to read the book uh me and rich my dm we're going to read the book, talk about it a little bit in one episode, and then in that episode, we're going to come up with what seven uh, like episodic games would look like, and then we're going to play them over the course of the next seven weeks. So we're going to like break down the world and um, you know big. I guess, moments or themes of the book and then create new characters to explore that structure with. Um, and we've decided to start with Superpowered Year One because uh, I thought that it it lent itself to having a fun superhero RPG. But my DM and I have been arguing about what game would work best to play Superpowered. Um, do you have... So we, we're looking at um, City of Mist and... Uh, I've I've really wanted to get it more toward mutants and masterminds, do, but do you have like a recommendation for a good system that you think would work for the superpowered's world? Yeah, unfortunately, there really isn't yeah. like a defining <laughs> uh, superhero game in the same way that there is for D and D. Isn't that frustrating? Because, <laughs> it, yeah, it, but I get it though. Like that's the problem is with when you go superhero, you have to account for so. <laughs> much like i played mutants and masterminds and i played a super speed character and i was broken i was wildly broken i was literally running in from half a mile away doing a giant blast on the enemies running a half mile (laughs) back away in my turn and so like i never got hit i could never be touched it was and that's the problem um i would say the only success stories i've heard of like closer to balanced games and a system that can supposedly accommodate anything is uh savage worlds Okay. Um, which is like D6 based. It's been a while since I played it. Um, but I remember it was D6 based. It was based on successes. And supposedly you could tailor it to fit any setting needed. Now, I've never run a Savage Worlds game. Yep. I only played in a Savage World game. So I can't testify to the legitimacy of that claim. Interesting. Okay. Well, we'll definitely check that out. We're leaning towards City of Mist, but it's so focused on, I don't know if you know it, but it's so focused on like investigation of, of, mysteries linked to your powers and things that it kind of narrows you know unless you completely break it right it like narrows the focus of what you know the characters are exploring um yeah and is good but i would i would make sure like talk to your gm like you're gonna (laughs) you're gonna have to probably balance outside the rules like you're you're gonna have to like play probably play a few test games and rework things D- don't be afraid to change the system on that one because it's it, it, it's not but again like it's kind of hard to balance a superhero game you're just gonna have to balance the game you're in and like not worry about oh but what if this power comes into play yep yeah i just can't wait i think it's gonna be super fun uh do, what uh first for superpowers year one what would you say are like some of the moments that should definitely appear in those episodes? I mean, obviously like the mountain climb and the kidnapping, uh, but without any big spoilers, like uh, maybe the, the, the freshman year party um, that Angela puts on, or I don't know uh, what, what moments do you think should be maybe some of the more subtle stuff that you think are crucial toward the, the story developing? It's going to sound like a cop out, but genuinely, I think that kind of depends on the group you're playing with. I yeah. mean, if they're the more like super battle heavy ones, um, then you're probably going to want to clip through like the major combat arcs, you know, the yeah. freshman uh, test, the ranking match. Uh, yeah, a couple of ranking matches. Um, you can absolutely throw in um, the labyrinth, of course, in mid year. Um, so, you know, that if you're, if it's more combat focused, obviously hit those high notes. Um, if they're super RP focused, uh, maybe go for some of the smaller moments like the parties and, or the beer pong tournament or the <laughs> yeah. terrible movie nights. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's sort of hard to say because a game should always be directed, uh, by the feelings of the players. Yep. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Like those moments in the books are my favorite for sure. Like I like the battle stuff, especially the the year two um, team matches are some of my favorites. Um, but 
it's it's the the fun party scenes it's like chad bartending you know it's like that stuff that i really really love in these books um was did you draw on like your own experience for this stuff or is this just all like daydreams come to life for you in what might shock absolutely <laughs> no one who is aware of my work uh i have bartended yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh i mean i don't know, i i guess uh, probably a lot of it is uh, remembering some some personal experience in life. And uh, I mean, I went to a party college. And so that was always funny to me when people were like, boy, there's a lot of partying and super parties. I was like, <laughs> you guys have no idea how to take my I scaled day. it back. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're like, they go to a party like maybe once a semester. <clears throat> I would wake up on Tuesday drunk from Sunday and keep going. <laughs> It's okay. My mom doesn't listen to podcasts. She'll never know. <laughs> nice. Good. Good. You're, you're clear. Oh man. That's hilarious. So, so in your, in your superpowers world, it would be mostly partying with a little bit of uh, battle school put in there. I would never have had the discipline to be in that <laughs> program. And uh, I love my alma mater, but Texas Tech is probably not the place they'd host. <laughs> that's actually uh, kind of leads into the next thing I wanted to ask you about. So, I want to talk to you about like how you did this web serial because man, your schedule for a while there, like the, the, the speed at which you had to release content was pretty, pretty demanding. Uh, I know that that's coming to an end is, does that open your schedule up or has it become like a routine at this point? Oh no, it'll definitely open my schedule up. So, I mean, for, I want to say superpowers launched in about 2009, late 2009, maybe early 2010. And uh, from then until January 1st of this year, of 2018, um, I did two a week with a, an optional bonus chapter, depending on how like donations went. But toward the end, it was averaging three. And it wasn't, honestly, once I was writing full time, it really wasn't that demanding in terms of overall scope. But it was sort of hard because it was a thing that had to keep being refreshed. And, you know, you have to keep rebuilding your buffer keep writing out ahead. But meanwhile, I actually have to keep writing books to pay the rent and everything. Um, that you had so, the whole audible release of, a, of um, uh, cur the what was it? The curse? Secondhand curses. Secondhand curses, which I listened to like twice already. Uh, but you had that like right in the middle of that really busy time. Like I was like, God, is, you must not sleep. <laughs> I sleep terribly, but yeah, it's not right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> was up at five this morning for no reason, but hey, oh. I got my writing done by nine. <laughs> insomnia. Um, yeah, no, like so now that that's that's uh, in the past, but you're still working on as many projects. Like, uh, how does that? You know, how, are you? What what difference is that now for you in in your life? So functionally, um, I don't think anyone's really going to see a difference for probably the first year of this change, um, because what I'm trying to do now that I've sort of passed the web serials is I'm not slowing down by any means. I'm still going to continue producing content at uh, the same rate. I still have my daily quotas I have to meet that I impose on myself. But my goal now is to start working ahead. Instead of having a buffer on my serial, I want to have a buffer on my books. Um, and what that lets me do is that lets me get everything squared away long before release. That lets me knock out covers, editing, formatting. And most importantly, once I actually have a buffer, because I, I run tight deadline to deadline right now. That's why there's a delay in my audiobooks. Because the full book is only ready a couple of weeks before you know, the, it goes to ebook. So my right. goal is to eventually have built up enough of a buffer to where I can start doing simultaneous ebook and audiobook releases like I did with Forging Hephaestus. Um, and so that's sort of the thing you'll see. It's not going to be necessarily a huge difference in quantity output, because I think three years probably my max. Um, but hopefully it will smooth things out and make for kind of more seamless releases. And my audio folks won't have to keep waiting um, for, you know, the secondary release. So that's, that's kind of my long-term goal now that I don't have the serial on my plate. Uh, but again, obviously I have to build that buffer before I can reap the benefits of that buffer. So we probably won't start seeing anything like that until maybe mid 2019. So, and I know you probably get asked this a lot, but um, what, you've released year four as a web serial and everyone, you know, uh, like you're, I've read it, you know, people have read it. What, what happens in between um, the release of this, the last, the last chapter landing on the serial to the book releasing on Amazon that 
takes that amount of you know uh, time to where it's not ready for the you know for Kyle to start the audio book until you know a week or two before it launches on Amazon. Well, luckily on this one, I had been sort of dealing with editors <laughs> as we went, like getting it edited in chunks. <laughs> yeah. Um, cause if we had had to do it, like I did with year three, it would not be out probably until maybe late summer. Um, because it is a gigantic book. It's yes. 450 something thousand words, I think around there. And, um, so what happens is I get it edited by my first editor. Um, I do revisions. I get it edited by my second editor. I do revisions. Um, I send it to my beta readers. They all check it. They, they send it back to me with notes and things they've caught more revisions. Uh, so basically, when it finally ended on the 1st of January, it was done, obviously, well before that. But I still had to do the pass through of editor one, come back, editor two, come back, and cover art and getting everything squared away. And I have to set a pre order up far enough away in advance that I know I can make it. <laughs> yeah. even if there's delays. So it's, I did a whole blog about like, there's a difference between written and done. And that's sort of all that post process is like, really, tightening things up, um, smoothing things out, getting rid of all my typos, my errors, um, and really just trying to make the book as polished as possible. So uh, I want to, can you describe like how Corpies came about? Because Corpies, it's a, you know, it's a spinoff from the Superpowered series. Uh, and it was such a like, it's such a unique and interesting spinoff for me because it, it didn't, you know, it wasn't like you took a character from the books that had graduated or something and like, like it, it really did exist like on the side, but impacted what was going on to such a big degree. Like what was the process of like starting and, and I guess just starting Corpies and, and how that went? Um, I honestly just kept thinking of, um, you know, more about the story of Owen Daniels and Titan. And, you know, I really liked that character and there was a strong reaction to him. And so that was enough like, okay, so if I want to write more, there's an audience. And that's that's important. I mean, <laughs> this is my job. I have to pay the bills. <laughs> um, so it's good. So that's part of it. Like if there's an audience for it and I want to write it, it's kind of a why not. And that's where I was. I, I had a less ambitious schedule at the time. Um, and I just decided to take on a second serial and it, I really liked getting to write about it. I liked getting to sort of explore this character. And to be honest, I'd always sort of wanted to try my hand at writing uh, a character like Titan, a, if you will, the invulnerable Superman-esque, how do you provide do you challenges for Superman question, yeah. you know? And so I, I'd always really wanted to try and see if I could tackle something like that. And Owen was really my chance to do it in universe with existing continuity and the story I wanted to tell. Yeah. Titan's amazing. And the idea of the corporate superhero is also like, how did that come about? Again, just like rooted in realism, I was thinking, okay, well we have this governmental structure system, but capitalism is still in play. People want to make money. Superpowers are still cool. Like it's the <laughs> thing I think I never forget in my books. Superpowers are cool. Hell yeah. <laughs> People know it. And so I just sort of kept thinking like, okay, well, what would be a thing you could do? And I was thinking about the way we've like privatized jails, privatized military things, privatized a lot of stuff. And I was like, why not privatized emergency responders, especially ones like with superpowers who are, they're going to be uncomfortable or limited in what they can do in other systems. Yeah, I, I really like the whole idea of like, hey, they are not certified. There is this like overarching um, structure of oversight, but you know, there's this room for these uh, non-certified, super-powered people to, you know, to to make a living and and do some good at the same time. And uh, I I just loved uh, pretty much everything about Corpies. It was the book that really cemented the the series for me. It was kind of the anchor of the series for me. Um, strangely, uh, so, um, let's talk a little bit about villains code. Uh, when, uh, so the first book is out already. Um, and I, I don't know, I'll let you describe like, what is the idea of these vil like the villains code and like, where, where did this organization that's in between these, like just awful apocalyptic villains who just want to like murder and do all these bad things and the good guys, like, where did that spring out of for you? It sort of came out of like frustration sometimes because I would, you know, watch comics or, or deal with the superhero world and I would see situations where it'd be like, oh no, the world's in danger and it's only the heroes. And all I could think was, 
I feel like Doctor Doom has a dog in this fight. <laughs> yeah. Like, if the world's gonna end, that's everybody's problem. And if you don't assume your characters are stupid, they know that. And um, you know, from that, it just sort of came out of I wanted to write villains who were pragmatic and intelligent who actually tried to take, okay, what's the easiest solution for us to do that we get to enjoy our lifestyle, but we don't have to die or live in jail. And so it sort of came out of, um, that was sort of the core of the guild. And then I'd really been wanting to just write this villain story for a long time. And I actually tried two other iterations and they both got over 50K and it just, I had to throw them away because it, it wasn't clicking and it wasn't right and it wasn't what I wanted it to be. And I think the problem with those looking back is that I tried to do what I did with SP and I tried to root them in realism to a certain extent. And uh, the third try was when I just said, screw it. Everything's on the table, magic aliens like just go nuts like full silver age whatever and it just became so much fun that i was like oh yeah no this is this is the one <laughs> yep i it's so funny how you describe it like like superpowers being rooted in realism because when people say that these days they're usually talking about like oh it's dark and gritty like dark night it's like so real and like no like this is actually rooted in realism like these kids who have superpowers going to college and like you know playing beer pong and then like having to like battle each other but they're friends and they you know like i love that like it's actually what we may i mean if we actually had super powers in this world, what we'd probably actually be dealing with at that, at that age. And uh villain's code still kind of feels like that. Although you're right. It's as if it's been unchained, right? Like uh, I, who's the, oh, I'm so bad with character names. So I very much apologize, but who's the character that basically goes between all the realities and Nexus. Yeah. Nexus is so badass because it's completely untethered from anything. Right. And He's just kind of, he's like a watcher, right? Like he's, he's monitoring the situation to see where he can like step in. And it doesn't seem like he has any clear motivation, but I'm guessing, I don't know, he might. Um, but yeah, he, he, how do you, how do you know when a character like that fits into your story? We have to know what they want that. I think that's really core. I've, I've, I've talked about character creation before. And um, one of the core aspects is you have to know what your character wants and not like in the big grand I want to, you know, paint the greatest masterpiece way. Like, no, what does he want today? Does he want to get through? What does he want at the end of his week? Is he really hoping for like just a nice party or like a movie and a beer? <laughs> or is he working? Is like everything about him. Like, he's like, I want this promotion, but why? Like, is he trying to buy something? He's trying to do something. So I'm, I'm a huge advocate of know what your characters want. And then sort of once you have that, it's a lot easier to know where to insert them. And so once I knew Nexus's motivation, um, he became just a, a very uh, simple to know when he would and wouldn't step forth. Yeah, because he does pop up at such interesting times. And it's like, oh, you could he could come in all the time or never. Like, this is so random. It's awesome. Um, you mentioned earlier that sometimes you just have to, like, scrap something and mm -hmm. start over. We kind of saw that recently with Blades and Barriers what's the status of am I, I you can just say i can't talk about this but like what what's uh is there anything going on with that in the background right now oh no um i mean i i, I do intend to like i'm very upfront about that but i'm also upfront about i tried to do uh my works in a series for like i try to hit every series somewhat uh, somewhat regularly because you know different readers have different yep. series they like and just because i'm doing one doesn't mean i'm fulfilling what everybody's looking for so i try to work my way through so since superpowers is getting a release this year um obviously that's low it's on my totem pole queue. right it's back of the queue because now i've got i'm um, i'm finishing up the fifth fred book right now um and after that i'm moving on to the fourth spell swords and stealth book and after that i've got to work on villain codes two or villains code two um I'll probably do a shingles in there somewhere. Those are not hard. They're a couple weeks because they're so short. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> um, You're but like easy. yeah, it's like by, by my word counts. Oh my God, that's nothing. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I've got all that, all those existing audiences who've been waiting patiently for their next entry before I can rightfully come back to look at another SP project. I have to say, you spoil 
uh, like I'm, uh, we talked about it before we went on. I listen to a lot of books on audible because I'm just usually very busy and like, I can continue like quote unquote reading when I'm in the car and stuff like that. And like you spoil the crap out of us because like, you've got like 30 hour, 40 hour books <laughs> where it's like, Oh, I don't have to work. Like, this is awesome. I get all this great content and like, it's it'll carry me through the whole month <laughs> or or you know a couple weeks or whatever and oh man i i now like when i go to audible i get annoyed when something's like hey you're, you're delivering me a book that's less than seven hours come on <laughs> figure it out that we does need feel more. low <laughs> yeah i uh, uh apparently i have a, a growing following in the trucking community because you get so much content for one credit yes yes it's 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 awesome it's like the best and I've been listening to them. The other great thing is because it's so long, like because it's so much content that you never get everything. Like I've been going back and re-listening to the books over. I probably listened to Superpowers through year three, including Corpies, I think five times in the last year. And I'm That's still picking up time. on it. Yeah, because <laughs> I still, I didn't even catch, my one of my favorite scenes, I didn't even catch until like the third listen through where um where transport takes uh, during parents weekend where transport takes vince to his favorite sandwich spot on the beach mm -hmm. like for some reason i had missed that whole chapter the first couple times i listened to it through i don't know what happened uh but now it's like my favorite scene because it was like this hidden gem that popped back up in the third listen through um so you know i i just love that your books have that uh, reread ability that so many others don't well thank you is that, do you, I mean, like, do you think about that when you're writing these? Like, oh, like there's so many nuggets to explore. Like, and it's not like, it's not like stupid Easter eggs, like in, like in comic books, like in a lot of comic books or in like the CW TV shows. It's like, there's valuable layers of content throughout everything that once you've learned something, it, it paints it in a whole nother light. Like, how do you, is, is it, is that in your outline? Like, how do you get to that point? Well, I mean, we do benefit from the fact that we know the full story before you do. Um, so, I mean, like, even sure. <laughs> when we do a rough draft, that's part of what the difference between a rough draft and a finished book is every um, thing that didn't properly lead to the ending, um, everything that didn't point in the right direction, unless it was an intentional red herring. Um, you can cut it away, you can retool it, you can fix it. So basically, you know, in the polishing process, that's part of it is making sure everything is flowing logically into the next part and, you know, just sort of structuring it all so it makes sense and maybe adding a, a little bit of depth here and there, especially if you know what's coming ahead. Um, you can add a little bit of foreshadowing or a few tricks. And I, I'm of the opinion that when you start a series, you should know the end of your series. Um, <laughs> and uh you need is... to talk to jj abrams about that yeah. uh he could he could use that lesson potentially my rule is i'm never allowed to ask a question i don't know the answer to okay maybe I'm never, I'm never allowed to raise a question i don't know the answer to that's a good rule uh really like a rule that isn't followed as much as it should be in uh i think modern media they're like oh somebody else will answer that question for me when i'm not on the project um have you like have you ever dabbled in script in like screenwriting? Because, uh, and we talked about this earlier too, like the super powered series almost feels like it's a, it's like made to be a TV, like a, like a 24 episode TV show. Uh, I think you could probably even do, uh, two, like you could stretch it out to two years or two seasons of television per year. Uh, if you really wanted to dive into the content, um, like, have you explored, first of all, have you ever done screenwriting or script writing? And then secondly, like, have you explored the, you know, optioning this stuff? Uh, I have never done script writing. I did read a lot of scripts um, okay. in my youth because again, theater and uh, actually I did a lot of theater. I was did competitive theater in high school and uh, played around with it a lot in college. So, but no, I mean, that's pretty much my extent with uh, scripts. I guess I just, in my head, it's structured out that way because it made sense for a serial format. So I probably kind of deferred to the ideology of scenes here and there, all leading to like a final art conclusion. Um, and then, no, nothing has been optioned uh, as of yet, but I am absolutely open to changing that if any listeners would like to reach <laughs> out. You, ever, anyone listening out there, contact Drew because this is, if if done right, this is like a, I I think a like super 
obvious hit TV show. Uh, it has to be done. Like, I feel like these new cable networks where it's not like super gritty, but it's also not super soapy. Like the CW is like the perfect spot for something like this. Um, I don't know. Like where, where would you see it living uh, in the TV landscape right now? Oh, uh, I mean, I guess given the level of content, uh, cursing and violence, <laughs> presumably it would have to be either extended cable or Netflix. Yeah. I mean, Ooh, Netflix. if we're, if we're presuming there's no like heavier censorship changes, which I wouldn't really want, um, then I think those are basically the only ones that could accommodate it. Although if Michael Shore ever wanted to take a run at it, I might trust him enough. Uh, the Good yeah. Place is the best thing I've ever seen in terms of writing and foreshadowing. So yeah, I uh, he he could have a shot without question. NBC awesome. or not? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the problem, right? Like yeah, whatever. Like, contract uh, he has I don't trust NBC, NBC, but I trust Michael Shore. <laughs> <laughs> That would be hilarious, though, if it were a Netflix sh show where it goes from being like a web serial where you've like written it to like play out as like arcs, like one chapter at a time to being a TV series that they just dump it all on you at once. Uh, it's almost like it's, you know, gone full circle and like the uh, tail eating the snake or whatever. Uh, that would be that would be crazy. I feel like it would have to be released episodically, though. like it's the mysteries that that kind of ensue like you'd want them to take place over a long period of time right i mean given the length of these books it's probably gonna take a long time to stream <laughs> anyway so <laughs> probably washes out about the same That's probably true um so uh yeah let's talk about some of your other stuff like uh I keep I just refer to it as NPCs because I love that that title. But uh, the series uh, spell what is it? Spell sword, sword spell. Spell sword itself. But to be perfectly honest, most people know it as the NPC series. Yeah, that's how I always kind of referred to it. I am lazy that way. Um, so the essentially that's a D and D game where the NPCs take on a quest and basically become the player, right? In a manner of speaking, they pretend to be adventurers until they aren't pretending anymore. <laughs> Yeah. And it like plays with like, uh, it's so funny. Like that was, uh, I wasn't into D and D when I started reading them and it was one of the things, uh, it was like a culmination of like Harmon quest and critical role and NPCs that kind of got me like thinking about D and D in this, in this new way. Um, and so, so thank you for being one of the people to introduce me to all of this stuff, but it's, what I took from it is just how funny it, like it was just so hilarious. Like at every step, these like kind of bumbling NPCs becoming the adventuring party. Um, how did you like, like how did you come up with that? Uh, was it during one of your games or did it just come out of like loving, loving the games themselves? I think it kind of came out of as a natural extension of being a DM for so long because you, you know, when you're building all these NPCs and these towns and these things, you you sort of have to put some consideration into who they are. Well, depending on the game you're playing, but sometimes you have to put consideration into who they are, their motives, their thoughts, et cetera, so you can uh, play them better, especially if they're key. So, you know, when you've been doing that for long enough, the idea just sort of starts to trickle in of like, what, what are these people doing between these attacks? Like, what's... What's the middle ground? What's the life? I, I like to say my books are about finding the mundane and the magical. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a very good, uh, a very, very good, I don't know, motto or catchphrase. But uh, it's like Toy Story, right? It's like Toy Story for Dungeons and Dragons. Like, what are they doing when you're not playing with them? You know, I've never heard that before, but that's a pretty apt comparison. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, you know... Uh, I, I think that of all of like, that would be like such a fun Pixar movie just to see uh, what, you know, what would happen with this game that comes alive when nobody's watching, you know, um, go pick it up. If you guys are into D and D pick up that series. It's, it's amazing. Um, and you also mentioned that you're working on book two of villains code. Um, how, how do you see the story evolving? I mean, without spoilers, like it just left off. It's such a, moment of change is the second book going to feel like are, are you taking the tone in a different direction or like how how are you going about you know going into the second chapter of this huge world that you've built with villains code so one of my um 
friends, uh, John Hartness, asked me why the book was so long when there were other parts where it could have ended. Um, and my answer to him sort of answers this question in a way. And it's, I ended the book where I felt like the story needed to end because in, in my view of the Villains Code series, um, this book was almost meant to serve as an introduction to the world and set everything up because it's the end of a time of peace, sort of. I mean, I don't want to drop spoilers and everything, but sure. um, it is a time of change. And that's why I'm choosing to tell the story. Like we started where we did in Villains Code a little before it so that the reader had a chance to like get familiar with the world and get comfortable with the rules and sort of know the main players. Um, and then really the, the series is kicking off. Like a lot of it is going to be fallout from the events of this first book, because I mean, if you, if you remember the end, a big sort of Pandora's box has been opened and mm -hmm. that's going to fuel a lot of things and issues. Yeah, that's I, I can't like that's the one that I like my personal tastes lean toward the most. Like I cannot wait for for book two. Uh, theoretically, we'll probably you know, you've had these um, robots, uh, the similar robots show up in both villain in the Villains Code series and the end and uh, and the Superpowered series. Theoretically, we'll see robots with different color cores show up in NPCs and Fred at some point. Uh, probably not. They're not. <laughs> yeah. uh, they don't play by those rules. <laughs> Although robots and NPCs would be weird. Oh, then again, Nexus <laughs> exists, so a multiverse exists. So you there know, you go. anything's possible. <laughs> Connected in some way. So yeah. the only one I I haven't personally read yet is the Fred series, which is in my queue. Uh, what's give me the pitch? Like, why should I like? Why should I be? Why should that be the next book that I pick up? So I like to say that Fred is examining the idea that changing what you are doesn't necessarily change who you are, um, and it's a take on. I got a little bit burned out on urban fantasy for a while because I felt like they were all following the exact same plot structure of a uh, person is initially bad at life. Person becomes supernatural person resists it. Person embraces it. And they're the baddest mofo East of the Rio Grande. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't, I was like, Oh my God, I've seen this so many times. Um, there were, there was a while there were a lot of Dresden clones. <laughs> I yeah. love Dresden don't love all the clothes <laughs> but um and so fred was just my idea of satire of that it was uh, a man who is uh cowardly and socially awkward and better with numbers than people and becomes a vampire and he is cowardly and socially awkward and better with numbers than people um fred is sort of a victim of circumstances in that because he is a vampire people keep expecting behavior of him and he just wants to be left alone <laughs> to do his job and hang out with his friends and have a nice, peaceful life. Um, and so it's sort of that. It's the every man in a supernatural world, but rather than embracing it and kicking butt, he's just still that every man just trying to keep above water. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll be I'll definitely be checking it out. Uh, I wish that I'd already read it so I'd have more follow up questions. But it's you know I'm a big Buffy fan, so it's it's definitely been in my queue because of just the tie into that supernatural type type world and the humor uh, that I know that you have in in a lot of your writing. Um, so I, I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely give it a shot. Everyone out there, Fred, Fred the Vampire Accountant. Um, there's actually a question from the chat uh, from Anka. Um, what motivated you to start writing? How do you prevent writer's block? And what are your favorite reads at the moment? So I guess we could take those uh, one at a time. What what initially motivated you to start writing? Oof. Uh, to be perfectly frank, I mean, I liked writing as a, when I was younger. Um, but then I did it in college and I sort of burned out on it for a while because it was academic writing, which is just the worst. Yeah. It's like, hey, tell the professor what they want to hear in 500 words. <laughs> about All this right. thing that you don't really care that much about. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I took a class my senior year that was a blow-off class. And it was literally like, it was like, hey, this is mandatory to graduate, but we have nothing to teach you. So I don't know, write five pages <laughs> on whatever. <laughs> and, nice. Yeah. But because of that, like, because he would give these like haphazard prompts and like no one cared, it was just like a fun <laughs> workshop thing. Um, I really started like stretching my my creative legs again, and I remembered, oh right, I liked this. I did like this used to be a thing I liked, and um, 
And then when I kind of graduated and got into the world and I ended up at an office job where I was bored for a lot of the day and I got really into web serials. And then I thought, what if I tried my hand at it? And I uh, decided to try and write a book and it was terrible. <laughs> and then I decided to try a second one and it was okay. So I made it a web serial about a kid winning the lottery. Awesome. And, uh, and then when that one was done, I was still having fun. And so I just sort of went with superpowers and it's been going since then. Yeah, no, I'm so happy that you decided to to try your hand. And that's the thing I, I, I talk to a lot of people about this too, is like, you know, we're consumers, uh, most, most of us, right? Like we consume a lot of media and like, we're in this time now where like, you can get your stuff out there. So like turn, I, I, I encourage everybody, like turn whatever your passion is from like that consumption into, into like some sort of a creation. And like, you know, you, you might be surprised with where you get with it, you know? And, uh, was that like a worry at any point? Were you like, oh, what, like, is you know, am I wasting my, like, was there ever a like worry about it or was it always just like, oh, I'll do this on the side and see where it goes? It was never a worry because it was a hobby. Right. I mean, for the longest time, it was just a thing I did for fun. Um, and only once I made the book or made SP year one at the request of readers to like, hey, can we have a portable version? Because this website's a pain, which, yeah, fair. They're giant books. It takes a while. Um, and it kind of started selling. And that was when I was like, oh, should I look at this as a career? And that kind of launched from there. Um, what was the second question? I the second one was, how do you prevent writer's block? And then the last one is, what are your favorite reads at the moment? So w choose one of those two and we'll... we'll, we'll um, well, I'm not reading right this moment because I'm writing and I like to <laughs> do my reading between books so I can kind of stay focused on the voice and idea I have. Um, but my uh, so writer's block, um, I actually I got this from Robert Brockway of crack.com in an article he wrote and I thought it was really good advice and I try to share it where I can. Um, you can't edit a blank page. You can't improve a blank page. So if you are stuck, write anyway. And if it's absolutely terrible, then you know the direction you don't want to go in. And if it's absolutely terrible, except like one part's kind of okay, keep that one part and kind of just keep going from there. Like find things that work. And so I just plow through. Like that's that's the honest truth of it is I have the comfort of knowing this is a rough draft. And even if I write a bad chapter, it doesn't have to stay a bad chapter. It just has to get me to the next part and then I can keep going. And then when all the rewrites and polishes and edits, I can come back to this and be like, oh, now that I know where this story is going much better, I have uh, things I can layer in, I have enough story structure, and I can sort of rebuild it or rewrite it as necessary. So my my writer's block advice is sort of my advice for most things in life, just power through. <laughs> um, because that's yeah that's the worst is when you don't yeah. know what to do and but that that's really good advice find those nuggets just write something and find those nuggets on the page to expand on um so let's just uh let's wrap this up with superpowered year four coming out on the 20th of february it's in five days on amazon we'll put a link in the show notes i've got a bone to pick with you though about the ending without spoiling anything you said in a post what the graduating class was and there is one in there that I, you probably know who I'm talking about, that I was very shocked that she was uh, graduating over another girl uh, that can turn invisible. Uh, what happened? What happened there? Um, I genuinely don't know which one you're talking about. <laughs> oh, uh, Violet, Violet. So Violet oh. over Brittany. That was a weird, like, I was like, what? No, Brittany. What's uh? I was shocked. Uh, pay attention in that last book, man. Violet kicks a lot of ass. Yeah. Like, she really tears it up. And I will say, what you read online is not the final version, remember? Yes, that's true. That is Continuity true. is not locked until publishing. That is, of course, the rule of web serials, because it has to be. Fair There's enough. no other way to do them. I just, I'm, um, I love Britney. So the class so has know, changed, like, but you might get a little more information about other characters. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, you know, there, she definitely kicked the $6 lines. right there. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, what else? Uh, I'll, before we go, uh, last words, Drew, and what should we be looking for you on the horizon? From you on the horizon? Oh, let's see. Uh, I am doing 
the fourth book in our Authors and Dragons Shingles series that we're doing this year. Um, it's a book a month. They're about 20 to 30,000 words. They are comedy horror uh, written by terrible people. And if that release structure and the fact that we named it after a skin ailment sounds familiar, it's not. It's protected by parody law, and it's not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I get April, uh, and mine is going to be Alien Stole Our Keg. Or Alien Aliens. Our Kegger. That's awesome. And um, the first one is The Ghost of Hooker Alley by Robert Bevan. You can pick that up right now. Um, you can always check me out on, of course, the Authors and Dragons podcast. Authorsanddragons.com will take you to our page, and that's all kinds of fun. Um, in terms of what's coming out for me, Superpowered Year 4 is February 20th. Superpowered Audio Year 4, because a lot of people ask me about this. I'm impressed. Kyle's getting it turned around to us by July 3rd, which, that's remember... Awesome. I only got it to him a little bit ago, and it's a huge book. So he is really going to be burning some midnight oil on that one. What's the over under on? Uh, is it going to be forty hours or more? They have it listed as thirty nine hours right now, but I <laughs> um, that has to be an estimate because year three is thirty nine hours. Yep, and year three is literally two thirds the size of year four. Wow, 50, 50, 45, possible 45 hour uh, audio, but I can't wait. My I goal is to get over two days. That's like, I really want it to be longer than two days because <laughs> I've never had that. And I feel like it's like, ah, oh, I'm so close. Come on. <laughs> How many authors can say that? I trust that you will get there at some point, Drew. And I'll be I'll be there buying that thing up day the day it comes out. Um, oh, the one last thing. Uh, if you have any listeners who are not familiar with the Super Powered series and would like to be, uh, they are going to be going on sale starting Friday the 16th, February 16th. Um, year one will go on sale on Friday. Um, year two on Saturday, Corpy Sunday, year three on Monday, and on year four, year four comes out. So you can get the whole precursing series for four bucks. And, and everyone should lot. definitely do that. Yeah, it's it, that's a lot of content for very for very little money. Uh, and you won't you won't regret it, guys. Like we talk about a lot of you know, nerd stuff here, like all the TV shows and movies that come out. We, we don't talk about a lot of fiction because uh, I, I don't know, like there's, there hasn't been a lot that's really spoken to us. And like, this is one of the, there's, there's some, but like, this is really the first one where I've, I've recommended it on our Friday podcasts. And I really hope that like, if you guys like the stuff we talk about here, you, you're going to like these books. They're, they're fun. Uh, I, I hesitate to say they're a slow burn, but like they, it's a big story. So there's, it has to be right. Like, so like really dig in there and, and I think you, you won't regret it. It's, it's, it's really, really good stuff. Slow bird is definitely the right phrase though. They are, <laughs> they are not short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, that, that, that intro, like the beginning where you meet the, the five superpowers, superpowers kids, um, it's crazy. Like uh, going back to that, I just get really nostalgic. Like the first time they're in the room together with transport and numbers, like introducing themselves, like that's some of that stuff is really, really fun. Like I wish that I could go back with uh, like, I need one of those mind erasers from men in black so I can just keep reading it over and over again, oh, which I do yeah. anyway, but you know, <laughs> um, anything else before we go, Drew? Oh no, that, that takes care of me. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming. It's been a blast. And uh, yeah, for everyone out there, um, if you go want to check out the Superpowers RPG Book Club, we're going to be uh, launching in March on Twitch uh, through the TPK Games uh, account, I guess, uh, our partnership. So it's uh, twitch.tv slash TPK underscore games. Um, right now, we're just started our Dungeon and Dragon series. We have have the two first two episodes over there on Twitch. Uh, it's the campaign, a D&D &D adventure. Um, so check that out. I play a turtle named Edgar Polk, uh, and it's, it's really fun. So if you guys like D&D, you should check that out. And uh, also uh, Authors and Dragons, which uh, I've been getting into. I, is the only way to check that out through the Patreon, or can you get that content in other ways? Oh, no. Authors and Dragons is completely free. You can okay. get that on any podcasting app, iTunes, etc. Um, Mimic Chest is the uh, Patreon we do. Gotcha. Um, and that's that's where the A and D crew steals the format of better podcasts and uh, <laughs> ruins it. Just ruins it. That's you guys awesome. can get a free sample of that one. We have our advice show up, and it is horrifying. I really can't believe people listen, but you know, it's great. <laughs>
Uh, you guys are hilarious. Okay, well, uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks for joining us, Drew. Um, and go out and buy Super Powers on Amazon. All the links will be in the show notes, and we'll see you. Go- oh, one last announcement. Um, we've had to postpone our review of Black Panther. Um, one of our hosts mis- mixed up on buying his tickets. And uh, he's actually going uh, tonight when we sh- or tomorrow when we should have been doing the review itself. So we're going to be coming back on Saturday for the Black Panther review. I hear. Have you uh, seen the movie or, or do you hear anything about it, Drew? I mean, I've heard great things. I have a ticket for tomorrow during a matinee uh, because I hate crowds and feel yeah. like that'll be my best shot. I usually don't do these movie reviews because I don't want to see the movie on opening weekend. So I come back like a week later with my opinions on, on like a random show. Like, oh yeah, I finally saw it. It was pretty good. But I'm uh, excited. I've heard great things. Yeah, I hope it's as good as people were saying. I mean, like Thor lived up to it. Uh, so I hope that this is another like Marvel hit, right? Like they've they haven't really uh, swung in. Really had a clunker. Yet. Yeah, the, I mean, even gonna... the Dark World was watchable. Exactly. Like everything they've done, like. It, you're if you're comparing against such a high bar right and so it's like yeah there's some that are less entertaining than others but they're all pretty damn good what's right. your favorite of the marvel cinematic universe movies do you have one? Oh god uh it's it's tough uh, guardians was up there for a yeah. while um i still love the original avengers but man ragnarok was so yes. good it was so good it's hard to it's hard to pick on that one. I would say probably Ragnarok or original Avengers. It's funny. I, I had those two for me, uh, Civ- uh, not civil war, uh, winter soldier. It has always been my favorite, but I think you're right. Like Thor, the, the latest Thor movie is just such a, I love the visuals of it. And the, it's so funny. Like, I just think they did such a great job. I hope they keep that up. Um, you and me so- both. Yeah, Black Panther will be back on Saturday with the review. And then uh, going into next week, just stay tuned. Our our schedule is shifting around as TV shows are ending. No more Star Trek. Uh, but Counterpart will be back next week. So just keep an eye at nerdrotic.com for all of our shifting scheduling. And uh, we'll see you later. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>